great to see everybody. This is my first NASIS as well, so thanks a lot to Vanessa and Carolyn for inviting me, and thanks to all you nice people for being nice. <laughs> um, so I know it's practical cartography day, so I want to talk mostly about process for um, hand rendered map illustration, but I wanted to say a little bit about what I think my job is when I'm doing maps like this. Um, this is a map that I made for Wendell Berry, who is an author who you might know best from his nonfiction work. But he's also a poet and a fiction writer. And he started writing about this fictional place, Port William, Kentucky, uh, a town that's based uh, about on the region where he lives. Uh, he didn't realize he was going to continue writing novels about this place for 30 years. So at, uh, after he had done that, um, I was hired to do a a map for a volume of collected fiction. So this map is uh, to help orient the readers and to help them determine how characters are moving around the landscape. Uh, another fictional map I made was for a law professor uh, who needed a book cover showing his idea, which he conceived of as a map. Um, he's, his book is about opportunities in careers and recreation that are available to everyone, but that uh, but there are bottlenecks that prevent people from getting to those opportunities. So his pencil sketch is on the left and my work is on the right. So in a case like that, uh, it's easy to figure out the page layout. We're going to have a barcode on the left lower side and then all that blurb information and the title information and spine and then what you have left is what you can work with. And since he, he gave me such a great uh, stick figure sketch, I knew sort of exactly what he wanted. Um, sometimes it's not as clear. Uh, this is a map um, made for a, a bar backsplash. So it's five feet wide, 18 inches high. Um, and the people uh, were renovating their house on the ocean and wanted to be able to point out to their visitors places they could see from the house, the oil derricks and the Channel Islands. They also wanted to use the map to commemorate um, their parents who had left them the house. So they, they uh, wanted me to show the steaks on the grill there <laughs> on the left. And um, the, uh, I did a drawing when I visited the site of the San Buenaventura mission on the right. They even wanted Mr. and Mrs. Twitchy, who were sandpapers who their parents fed on the beach every day. So. Um, a map like this, you can tell I'm filling it out with uh, things that are personal to this family. And in a, in a case like this, you're pretty liberated as far as scale goes, uh, different perspective views, different scales, and a map that's um, to scale, but you know, sort of a, a, a participant, but not the whole shebang. Um, that, was, that was a fun one. Uh, this is the purpose, really, of this map. This is a photograph of the map in place, and uh, it's shown as it's, as it's used as a place to tell family stories. So I'm glad that Ryan mentioned daydreaming, because it really is uh, an important part of the job. Uh, and one practical tip is to always be collecting references. Uh, I have about a billion bookmarks and also folders of actual reference uh, maps and sometimes not maps. I like to go really wide. Um, you can see here, I never make geological maps, but I think they're really beautiful. You can look at them for color and style. I'm also just collecting watercolors for, for style references and for color palettes. Um, Erwin Rice's works are always something to look at for pen and ink rendering and how to label things. Uh, I like Chinese landscapes because they, they make you think differently about perspective and layering. Um, and I go back to medieval maps pretty often because they're also liberating. You can see in the uh, center bottom map, the, um, the king on his throne is bigger than any of the <laughs> church buildings. And um, the light sources are coming from different directions. And it doesn't really matter. This map still has a really strong sense of place. I'm collecting also for composition as well as style. Um, I like these Leroy Appleton maps. They have a lot of information on them. They're just black and white with kind of loose edges, but a nice, neat frame. Um, the Vatican 
the, the uh, upper right map is from the Vatican Maps Gallery, which I look at a lot for color palette. But I also love those small inset maps on the bottom. These uh, maps are frescoes, but they're painted as though those are little scraps of paper and they actually painted push pins in them. So it's a, good for an idea of how to compose, uh, how to get your inset maps to work with the larger map. The map at lower right is made by an advertising illustrator, um, not a cartographer. It's showing the path of the Pequod, so he's got an inset of Nantucket and then the terrible journey through the oceans ending in the <laughs> sinking of the Pequod. Great map for color and also for incorporating story. Um, yeah, so failures <laughs> are another thing that, that uh, uh, it's good to be open to. Um, this is a, these are pencil drafts for a map I made of the Skiji market for a filmmaker. He had made a film about the globalization of sushi and he wanted a map to hang in his office to commemorate the film. Um, so the map is mostly about the Skiji market where fish is traded. We also wanted the view of the Tokyo Bay and an inset map of Japan. And at first I thought that maybe the water of the Sumida River, since it takes up kind of a lot of the map, could double as the water of the Tokyo Bay and even the ocean around Japan. Um, and I really wanted that to work and it really doesn't. So um, you can see at right I went back to historical maps to see how they incorporate different map views uh, and came up with a much more straightforward framed view and a big title cartouche to uh, bring out the point of the map, which is to show the Skiji market. This is the finished map with some detail views. So now I want to get into process a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk about a map that I did over the summer. Uh, an author in Texas contacted me to make a map of the Blanco River. He has a book of essays coming out. Uh, it's natural history and uh, it's about the people and places along the Blanco River. And we, we do say Blanco River in Texas. Um, it's in central Texas. Uh, and he wanted to be able to somehow, he didn't know how, but he wanted me to think about incorporating the stratigraphy of the river into the maps. And I, I happened at the same, around the same time to see this historic railroad map on the Library of Congress Twitter feed. Great map. Um, I think any time views are juxtaposed like this, it just really invites you to explore more and there's like a whole, you know, another layer of information you can get from seeing those two things in relation to each other. So for our map, uh, I just started with USGS map and um, he wanted all the tributaries of the river shown, so I'm just highlighting those and uh, highlighting the county lines. And um, this brings up a point that I mentioned to my authors a lot and that's that my job at this point is to drop out most of the information so that the reader will see what the author wants them to see. From there I'm just using tracing paper, going over it with a marker or a pen. Um, the author did not want the harsh lines of the watershed shown so I'm using uh, you know those caterpillar hash marks to, um, to show the hills that are surrounding the, the watershed. Uh, so this is a pencil version of the map that I sent to the author for approval. The blue line shows the uh, fold of the, this, this, is a, this was going to be painted, uh, printed as end paper maps. So there's no gutter per se, but that's going to fold that way. Um, you can see I made a simplified stratigraphic profile based on reports that he had sent me. And then we had a hydrogeologist hydro look at that and make sure it was okay. We added an inset map of the Blanco, which is small. It's only 87 miles long, which is a small river for Texas. And, uh, but the inset shows the path of the Blanco all the way out to the Gulf of Mexico. So once I have an approved pencil sketch, I'm going to think about moving to uh, watercolor paper. I use a 300 pound, a really heavy watercolor paper so it doesn't buckle and it can take lots of layers of paint. Um, and at this point I'm just doing samples of different colors to come up with a color palette and decide what, what inks I want to use. 
taking a lot of notes during this process because every time is different and I can't remember how I got to what I like. <laughs> um, so once I've done that, I'm just going to take tape the uh, pencil sketch down and put the heavy watercolor paper over it with the light table shining up from underneath and I can do all the ink work, all the line work that way. I like to do it at night because it's easiest to do in a dark, <laughs> dark room. It's kind of a fun, fun part of the project. So this is the final map. Uh, and you can show, I, you can see I, I really borrowed from that railroad map in showing the plan view right above the profile view. Uh, parts of this river are dry. Um, and so showing, showing the fault lines and the springs in the stratigraphic profile really help you understand why the, why the river is dry in some areas and where the resurgences are. Um, you can see I've used a, a unified color palette through the whole map to tie it together. And we've added yet another inset uh, showing the aquifers that the river runs through at the lower left. So to get to materials, I wanted to talk about materials um, in case anybody's wanting to do this. <laughs> um, the most important thing is to test, test everything. There are endless combinations of materials you can use, and they react differently. Paper uses different ingredients that uh, handle inks different ways, and inks use uh, recipes that you can't look up. It's proprietary stuff, so you can't really tell how things are going to react with each other until you test them. So every single combination you want to test, unless you want to spend a lot of money throwing away really nice watercolor paper. Um, the top strip is showing, I'm looking for a waterproof black ink that will stand up to watercolor washes over it. So that this is showing just black ink with clear water washes over it. And you can see there's a real variety of uh, how those inks are managing that. Um, I ended up using the platinum carbon, which you can see washed out a tiny bit, but did pretty well. And the Black Magic at far right is an ink that I know is waterproof, and I use it a lot. But on this particular paper, it, it bled a lot. So you can see the little feathered edges of that line work. So that was a no-go. And testing is a super fun part of the project for me, I think, just because I like to sketch and um, I like to collect pen nibs. <laughs> um, <laughs> but a lot of what you like will depend on your handwriting style and just your preference for how flexible or stiff you like a nib to be. Um, but there are a lot of, a lot of options, something for everyone. Uh, you can also use micron pens or markers, just get started. The, um, the Hunt 107 nib that I'm showing here is a nib that I use for most of my line work, and it's a $2 tool. So everybody can get one and just see if they like it. Um, it can take you from the little you know, uh, thin lines to uh, heavier lines, like shown on this little sample of a coast. And it's flexible. It's not super flexible, but it's flexible. So those, you can get little flicky lines from it, too. Most of my maps are delivered digitally, even though I make them by hand. Um, sometimes I deliver them as original art, but mostly as digital files. So uh, in those cases, I like to do the lettering on a separate sheet that can be really smooth and is easy to mess up, and just scan those and place the files, the uh, labels, in Photoshop. Uh, those are a couple of nibs that I like for, for lettering. And for the body of the map, I was just talking with um, our hero, Tom Patterson, about <laughs> using some of his shaded reliefs maps as a reference for doing painted maps. Uh, the map on the right, I used one of his uh, shaded relief maps just for reference. And this map on the right, the whole size of it is a real small book page. It's five by seven. So it's, uh, it's not important to get into the detail so much as to show the mountain ranges and um, I give a general idea of topography. But I'm starting in both cases with the lightest grays and just building up either in elevation, well, always in elevation, and then adding shade. And the same thing is done in watercolors. Um, I'm in the habit of mixing my color palettes and establishing that 
before I start. But just this summer, I went to an art uh, workshop for a week and, uh, and learned to be more bold with watercolor. In this technique that I learned, uh, we were using color almost straight out of the watercolor tube, um, waiting for it to dry completely, and then adding complementary colors on top of it. Uh, so this process shows, I mean, it's a horrific like bat I've got on the <laughs> top left. And then over the course of, this has got to be more than 50 layers of paint probably, but it adds a real richness uh, and depth that I'm really looking forward to trying out on uh, a couple of commissions coming up. So I've made a, um, I've made a handout, a paper handout of starter materials for people who might want to try. And they're all uh, low cost uh, materials that you can just start making maps at home. And I've added it to my website as the latest blog post too. Um, I'm going to follow this talk up with more talk about materials, because it turned out I had a lot more to say than I could say in 20 minutes about paper and inks and watercolors. Uh, so I hope you'll follow me on Twitter or send me an email, and um, we can be in touch with that. I can make sure you have those. Uh, but take a handout if you're interested. And uh, I've got them right up here. And that's what I have for you today. Thanks so much. Hi, thanks. It's really beautiful things Thank you. that you're making. Um, I'm curious, you said that you scan your maps in um, digitally and then usually send them off. Has, have you or any of your clients then taken those maps and then georeferenced them and then used them as base great, maps? Great or? idea. <laughs> Seems pretty obvious, but maybe right. not. Yeah. I don't think Let's anyone talk. has. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, because I don't mess with, uh, I'm usually working from your work or you know from copyright free from government sources so um, they're they're accurate uh, for the most part so that's that's a great question I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, adjustments you make ahead of time knowing that printing processes are going to mess with what it looks like on the paper or on the sc on the scan uh, line weight dot gain yes. color shift CMYK yeah, great question. Um, uh, it, uh, it helps to have a good relationship with your client and to know who the printer is. So often uh, editors don't want to be involved in that at all, and I'm sort of doing a lot of guesswork. Um, I have a, 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 a proofing source, a, a print a professional uh, art printing shop around the corner from my office. So if I want a color proof of what my work's going to look like on the page, I'll sometimes get a proof, a real proof from them. I also have a, a pretty good Canon inkjet printer at, in my office. Um, so I, you know, I can kind of see what's going to happen. But almost never does the budget allow me to you know, go to a press check or to get a real a match print. Sometimes, like for the, for the home renovation, they had a budget to do that, but mostly not. So I'm doing a lot of guesswork. Um, one thing that I do do, occasionally I'll do pen and ink maps for letterpress that are going to be letterpress printed. And in that case, I, I just zoom super far in and far as you can in Photoshop and just clean and clean, clean and make sure the rivers are opened up and you know, none of the lines are touching each other where they shouldn't be. I wish, I wish there were more often a budget for, uh, for getting match prints, but it doesn't always happen. Um, being in the hand-drawn cartography space, do you find there are any consistent themes throughout uh, the kinds of commission work that you get, the, the kinds of clients and work that they're actually looking for? Not really. It's a pretty great variety, which is part of why I like it. Um, uh, I make a lot of, part of part, another part of my business is making a lot of vector maps for historians and authors, so uh, some publishers want vector maps, but the, the hand-drawn maps really come from all sorts of places. I, I hope to be working later this uh, fall on map of a family farm for a, for a family that you know, wants to give an anniversary gift to their parents. Um, the filmmaker was great. The, um, it's just people who love maps mostly and who want a hand-drawn product. <laughs> 
Uh, this is not a question so much as a comment. I would, at some future NASIS, I would, perhaps next year, I would dearly love to go to a workshop on hands-on watercolor mapping. Really? How many would be interested in <laughs> Woo! Woo! <laughs> Everyone. That's really super great to hear. I wasn't <laughs> sure that this would fit into practical cartography day because it's not very practical, but uh, that's It's great. definitely practical. That's great. It's as heavily practical as possible. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi, um, I'm starting to make some maps for um, local history books that my friends are writing, do you have, but they're all digital, like ArcGIS. Do you have any tips for making the historic effect through digital? Uh, um, I'm not so good at that. Uh, when, when I try to produce a historic map, I just always default to, let's just do it by hand, and often, I mean, it's, uh, I'm sure there are people out there who are doing great, who have great uh, techniques for doing that, and I am not yet one of them, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, it's, yeah, it would be, for me, it would be like working backward. Um, that's how it would feel. But, yeah. Great, thanks, Molly. Thanks, everybody.